Tarzan of the Apes by Edgar Rice Burroughs Chapter Thirteen: His Own Kind The following morning Tarzan, lame and sore from the wounds of his battle with Terkoz, set out toward the west and the seacoast. He traveled very slowly, sleeping in the jungle at night and reaching his cabin late the following morning. For several days he moved about but little, only enough to gather what fruits and nuts he required to satisfy the demands of hunger. In ten days he was quite sound again, except for a terrible half-healed scar, which, starting above his left eye, ran across the top of his head, ending at the right ear. It was the mark left by Terkoz when he had torn the scalp away. During his convalescence Tarzan tried to fashion a mantle from the skin of Sabor, which had lain all this time in the cabin. But he found the hide had dried as stiff as a board, and as he knew naught of tanning, he was forced to abandon his cherished plan. Then he determined to filch what few garments he could from one of the black men of Mbonga's village, for Tarzan of the Apes had decided to mark his evolution from the lower orders in every possible manner, and nothing seemed to him a more distinguishing badge of manhood than ornaments and clothing. To this end, therefore, he collected the various arm and leg ornaments he had taken from the black warriors who had succumbed to his swift and silent noose, and donned them all after the way he had seen them worn. About his neck hung the golden chain from which depended the diamond-encrusted locket of his mother, the Lady Alice. At his back was a quiver of arrows slung from a leathern shoulder-belt, another piece of loot from some vanquished black. About his waist was a belt of tiny strips of rawhide fashioned by himself as a support for the homemade scabbard in which hung his father's hunting-knife. The long bow which had been Kulonga's hung over his left shoulder. The young Lord Greystoke was indeed a strange and warlike figure, his mass of black hair falling to his shoulders behind, and cut with his hunting-knife to a rude bang upon his forehead, that it might not fall before his eyes. His straight and perfect figure, muscled as the best of the ancient Roman gladiators must have been muscled, and yet with the soft and sinuous curves of a Greek god, told at a glance the wondrous combination of enormous strength with suppleness and speed. A personification, was Tarzan of the Apes, of the primitive man, the hunter, the warrior. With the noble poise of his handsome head upon those broad shoulders, and the fire of life and intelligence in those fine clear eyes, he might readily have typified some demigod of a wild and warlike bygone people of his ancient forest. But of these things Tarzan did not think. He was worried because he had not clothing to indicate to all the jungle folks that he was a man and not an ape, and grave doubt often entered his mind as to whether he might not yet become an ape. Was not hair commencing to grow upon his face? All the apes had hair upon theirs, but the black men were entirely hairless, with very few exceptions. True, he had seen pictures in his books of men with great masses of hair upon lip and cheek and chin, but nevertheless Tarzan was afraid. Almost daily he wetted his keen knife and scraped and whittled at his young beard to eradicate this degrading emblem of apehood. And so he learned to shave, rudely and painfully it is true, but nevertheless effectively. When he felt quite strong again, after his bloody battle with Terkoz, Tarzan set off one morning toward Mbonga's village. He was moving carelessly along a winding jungle trail, instead of making his progress through the trees, when suddenly he came face to face with a black warrior. The look of surprise on the savage face was almost comical and before Tarzan could unsling his bow, the fellow had turned and fled down the path, crying out in alarm, as though to others before him. Tarzan took to the trees in pursuit, and in a few moments came in view of the men, desperately striving to escape. There were three of them, and they were racing madly in single file through the dense undergrowth. Tarzan easily distanced them, nor did they see his silent passage above their heads nor note the crouching figure squatted upon a low branch ahead of them, beneath which the trail led them. Tarzan let the first two pass beneath him, 
but as the third came swiftly on, the quiet noose dropped about the black throat. A quick jerk drew it taut. There was an agonized scream from the victim, and his fellows turned to see his struggling body rise by magic slowly into the dense foliage of the trees above. With frightened shrieks they wheeled once more, and plunged on in their efforts to escape. Tarzan dispatched his prisoner quickly and silently, removed the weapons and ornaments, and, oh, the greatest joy of all, a handsome deerskin breechcloth, which he quickly transferred to his own person. Now, indeed, was he dressed as a man should be. None there was who could now doubt his high origin. How he should have liked to have returned to the tribe to parade before their envious gaze this wondrous finery. Taking the body across his shoulder, he moved more slowly through the trees toward the little palisaded village, for he again needed arrows. As he approached quite close to the enclosure, he saw an excited group surrounding the two fugitives who, trembling with fright and exhaustion, were scarce able to recount the uncanny details of their adventure. Mirando, they said, who had been ahead of them a short distance, had suddenly come screaming toward them, crying that a terrible white and naked warrior was pursuing him. The three of them had hurried toward the village as rapidly as their legs would carry them. Again Mirando's shrill cry of mortal terror had caused them to look back, and there they had seen the most horrible sight, their companion's body flying upwards into the trees, his arms and legs beating the air, and his tongue protruding from his open mouth. No other sound did he utter, nor was there any creature in sight about him. The villagers were worked up into a state of fear bordering on panic, but wise old Mabonga affected to feel considerable skepticism regarding the tale, and attributed the whole fabrication to their fright in the face of some real danger. "'You tell us this great story,' he said, "'because you do not dare to speak the truth. You do not dare admit that when the lion sprang upon Mirando you ran away and left him. You are cowards.' Scarcely had Mbonga ceased speaking when a great crashing of branches in the trees above them caused the blacks to look up in renewed terror. The sight that met their eyes made even wise old Mbonga shudder, for there, turning and twisting in the air, came the dead body of Mirando, to sprawl with a sickening reverberation upon the ground at their feet. With one accord the blacks took to their heels, nor did they stop until the last of them was lost in the dense shadows of the surrounding jungle. Again Tarzan came down into the village and renewed his supply of arrows, and ate of the offering of food which the blacks had made to appease his wrath. Before he left he carried the body of Mirando to the gate of the village, and propped it up against the palisade in such a way that the dead face seemed to be peering around the edge of the gatepost down the path which led to the jungle. Then Tarzan returned, hunting, always hunting, to the cabin by the beach. It took a dozen attempts on the part of the thoroughly frightened blacks to re-enter their village, past the horrible, grinning face of their dead fellow, and when they found the food and arrows gone they knew, what they had only too well feared, that Mirando had seen the evil spirit of the jungle. That now seemed to them the logical explanation. Only those who saw this terrible god of the jungle died, for was it not true that none left alive in the village had ever seen him? Therefore those who had died at his hands must have seen him, and paid the penalty with their lives. As long as they supplied him with arrows and food he would not harm them unless they looked upon him, so it was ordered by Mbonga that in addition to the food offering there should also be laid out an offering of arrows for this Munango Kiwati, and this was done from then on. If you ever chance to pass that far-off African village, you will still see before a tiny thatched hut, built just without the village, a little iron pot in which is a quantity of food, and beside it a quiver of well-daubed arrows. When Tarzan came in sight of the beach where stood his cabin, a strange and unusual spectacle met his vision. On the placid waters of the landlocked harbor floated a great ship, and on the beach a small boat was drawn up. But, most wonderful of all, 
a number of white men like himself were moving about between the beach and his cabin. Tarzan saw that in many ways they were like the men of his picture books. He crept closer through the trees until he was quite close above them. There were ten men, swarthy, sun-tanned, villainous-looking fellows. Now they had congregated by the boat and were talking in loud, angry tones with much gesticulating and shaking of fists. Presently one of them, a little, mean-faced, black-bearded fellow with a countenance which reminded Tarzan of Pamba the Rat, laid his hand upon the shoulder of a giant who stood next him, and with whom all the others had been arguing and quarreling. The little man pointed inland, so that the giant was forced to turn away from the others to look in the direction indicated. As he turned, the little, mean-faced man drew a revolver from his belt and shot the giant in the back. The big fellow threw his hands above his head, his knees bent beneath him, and without a sound he tumbled forward upon the beach, dead. The report of the weapon, the first that Tarzan had ever heard, filled him with wonderment, but even this unaccustomed sound could not startle his healthy nerves into even a semblance of panic. The conduct of the white strangers it was that caused him the greatest perturbation. He puckered his brows into a frown of deep thought. It was well, thought he, that he had not given way to his first impulse to rush forward and greet these white men as brothers. They were evidently no different from the black men, no more civilized than the apes, no less cruel than Sabor. For a moment the others stood looking at the little mean-faced man and the giant lying dead upon the beach. Then one of them laughed and slapped the little man upon the back. There was much more talk and gesticulating but less quarreling. Presently they launched the boat and all jumped into it and rowed away toward the great ship, where Tarzan could see other figures moving about upon the deck. When they had clambered aboard, Tarzan dropped to earth behind a great tree and crept to his cabin, keeping it always between himself and the ship. Slipping in at the door he found that everything had been ransacked. His books and pencils strewed the floor. His weapons and shields and other little store of treasures were littered about. As he saw what had been done, a great wave of anger surged through him, and the new-made scar upon his forehead stood suddenly out, a bar of inflamed crimson against his tawny hide. Quickly he ran to the cupboard and searched in the far recess of the lower shelf. Ha! Ah! He breathed a sigh of relief as he drew out the little tin box, and opening it, found his greatest treasures undisturbed. The photograph of the smiling, strong-faced young man and the little black puzzle book were safe. What was that? His quick ear had caught a faint but unfamiliar sound. Running to the window, Tarzan looked toward the harbor, and there he saw that a boat was being lowered from the great ship beside the one already in the water. Soon he saw many people clambering over the sides of the larger vessel and dropping into the boats, they were coming back in full force. For a moment longer Tarzan watched while a number of boxes and bundles were lowered into the waiting boats. Then, as they shoved off from the ship's side, the ape-man snatched up a piece of paper, and with a pencil printed on it for a few moments until it bore several lines of strong, well-made, almost letter-perfect characters. This notice he stuck upon the door with a small sharp splinter of wood. Then, gathering up his precious tin box, his arrows, and as many bows and spears as he could carry, he hastened through the door and disappeared into the forest. When the two boats were beached upon the silvery sand, it was a strange assortment of humanity that clambered ashore. Some twenty souls in all there were, fifteen of them rough and villainous-appearing seamen. The others of the party were of a different stamp. One was an elderly man, with white hair and large rimmed spectacles. His slightly stooped shoulders were draped in an ill-fitting, though immaculate, frock-coat, and a shiny silk hat added to the incongruity of his garb in an African jungle. The second member of the party to land was a tall young man in white ducks, while directly behind came another elderly man with a very high forehead and a fussy, excitable manner. After these came a huge negress, clothed like Solomon as to colors. 
Her great eyes rolled in evident terror, first toward the jungle, and then toward the cursing band of sailors who were removing the bales and boxes from the boats. The last member of the party to disembark was a girl of about nineteen, and it was the young man who stood at the boat's prow to lift her high and dry upon land. She gave him a brave and pretty smile of thanks, but no words passed between them. In silence the party advanced toward the cabin. It was evident that whatever their intentions, all had been decided upon before they left the ship, and so they came to the door, the sailors carrying the boxes and bales, followed by the five who were of so different a class. The men put down their burdens, and then one caught sight of the notice which Tarzan had posted. "'Ho, oh, mates!' he cried. "'What's here? This sign was not posted an hour ago, or I'll eat the cook!' The others gathered about, craning their necks over the shoulders of those before them, but as few of them could read it all, and then only after the most laborious fashion. One finally turned to the little old man of the top hat and frock coat. "'Hi, Professor,' he called. "'Step forward and read the bloomin' notice.' Thus addressed, the old man came slowly to where the sailors stood, followed by the other members of his party. Adjusting his spectacles, he looked for a moment at the placard, and then, turning away, strolled off muttering to himself, "'Most remarkable! Most remarkable!' "'Hi, old fossil!' cried the man who had first called on him for assistance. "'Did you think we wanted of you to read the bloomin' notice to yourself? "'Come back here and read it out loud, you old barnacle!' "'The old man stopped, and turning back said, "'Oh, yes, uh, my dear sir, a thousand pardons. "'It was quite thoughtless of me, yes, very thoughtless. "'Most remarkable, most remarkable!' "'Again he faced the notice and read it through, "'and doubtless would have turned off again to ruminate upon it "'had not the sailor grasped him roughly by the collar "'and howled into his ear. "'Read it out loud, you blithering old idiot!' "'Ah, yes, indeed, yes, indeed,' replied the professor softly, "'and adjusting his spectacles once more, he read aloud. "'This is the house of Tarzan, the killer of beasts and many black men. "'Do not harm the things which are Tarzan's. "'Tarzan watches. "'Tarzan of the apes.' "'Who the devil is Tarzan?' cried the sailor who had before spoken. "'He evidently speaks English,' said the young man. "'But what does Tarzan of the Apes mean?' cried the girl. "'I do not know, Miss Porter,' replied the young man, "'unless we have discovered a runaway simian from the London Zoo "'who has brought back an European education to his jungle home. "'What do you make of it, Professor Porter?' he added, turning to the old man. "'Professor Archimedes Q. Porter adjusted his spectacles.' "'Ah, yes, indeed, yes, indeed, most remarkable, most remarkable,' said the professor. "'But I can add nothing further to what I have already remarked in elucidation of this truly momentous occurrence.' And the professor turned slowly in the direction of the jungle. "'But, Papa,' cried the girl, "'you haven't said anything about it yet.' "'Tut, tut, child, tut, tut,' responded Professor Porter in a kindly and indulgent tone, do not trouble your pretty head with such weighty and abstruse problems. And again he wandered slowly off in still another direction, his eyes bent upon the ground at his feet, his hands clasped behind him beneath the flowing tails of his coat. "'I reckon the daffy old bounder don't know no more than we do about it,' growled the rat-faced sailor. "'Keep a civil tongue in your head,' cried the young man, his face paling in anger, at the insulting tone of the sailor. "'You've murdered our officers and robbed us. We are absolutely in your power. But you'll treat Professor Porter and Miss Porter with respect, or I'll break that vile neck of yours with my bare hands, guns or no guns.' And the young fellow stepped so close to the rat-faced sailor that the latter, though he bore two revolvers and a villainous-looking knife in his belt, slunk back abashed. "'You damned coward!' cried the young man. You'd never dare shoot a man until his back was turned. You don't dare shoot me even then. And he deliberately turned his back full upon the sailor and walked nonchalantly away, as if to put him to the test. The sailor's hand crept slyly to the butt of one of his revolvers, 
His wicked eyes glared vengefully at the retreating form of the young Englishman. The gaze of his fellows was upon him, but still he hesitated. At heart he was even a greater coward than Mr. William Cecil Clayton had imagined. Two keen eyes had watched every move of the party from the foliage of a nearby tree. Tarzan had seen the surprise caused by his notice, and while he could understand nothing of the spoken language of these strange people, their gestures and facial expressions told him much. The act of the little rat-faced sailor in killing one of his comrades had aroused a strong dislike in Tarzan, and now that he saw him quarreling with a fine-looking young man, his animosity was still further stirred. Tarzan had never seen the effects of a firearm before, though his books had taught him something of them. But when he saw the rat-faced one fingering the butt of his revolver, he thought of the scene he had witnessed so short a time before, and naturally expected to see the young man murdered as had been the huge sailor earlier in the day. So Tarzan fitted a poisoned arrow to his bow and drew a bead upon the rat-faced sailor, but the foliage was so thick that he soon saw the arrow would be deflected by the leaves or some small branch, and instead he launched a heavy spear from his lofty perch. Clayton had taken but a dozen steps. The rat-faced sailor had half-drawn his revolver. The other sailors stood watching the scene intently. Professor Porter had already disappeared into the jungle, whither he was being followed by the fussy Samuel T. Philander, his secretary and assistant. Esmeralda, the negress, was busy sorting her mistress's baggage from the pile of bales and boxes beside the cabin, and Miss Porter had turned away to follow Clayton, when something caused her to turn again toward the sailor. And then three things happened almost simultaneously. The sailor jerked out his weapon and leveled it at Clayton's back. Miss Porter screamed a warning and a long metal-shod spear shot like a bolt from above and passed entirely through the right shoulder of the rat-faced man. The revolver exploded harmlessly in the air, and the seaman crumpled up with a scream of pain and terror. Clayton turned and rushed back toward the scene. The sailors stood in a frightened group with drawn weapons, peering into the jungle. The wounded man writhed and shrieked upon the ground. Clayton, unseen by any, picked up the fallen revolver and slipped it inside his shirt. Then he joined the sailors in gazing mystified into the jungle. "'Who could it have been?' whispered Jane Porter, and the young man turned to see her standing, wide-eyed and wondering, close beside him. "'I dare say Tarzan of the Apes is watching us all right,' he answered in a dubious tone. "'I wonder now who that spear was intended for.' If for snipes, then our ape friend is a friend indeed. By Jove, where are your father and Mr. Philander? There's someone or something in that jungle, and it's armed, whatever it is. Ho, Professor! Mr. Philander! Young Clayton shouted. There was no response. What's to be done, Miss Porter? continued the young man, his face clouded by a frown of worry and indecision. I can't leave you here alone with these cutthroats, and you certainly can't venture into the jungle with me. Yet someone must go in search of your father. He is more than apt to wandering off aimlessly, regardless of danger or direction, and Mr. Philander is only a trifle less impractical than he. You will pardon my bluntness, but our lives are all in jeopardy here, and when we get your father back something must be done to impress upon him the dangers to which he exposes you, as well as himself, by his absent-mindedness." "'I quite agree with you,' replied the girl, "'and I am not offended at all. "'Dear old papa would sacrifice his life for me "'without an instant's hesitation, "'provided one could keep his mind "'on so frivolous a matter for an entire instant. "'There is only one way to keep him in safety, "'and that is to chain him to a tree. "'The poor dear is so impractical.' "'I have it!' suddenly exclaimed Clayton. "'You can use a revolver, can't you?' "'Yes. Why?' I have one. With it you and Esmeralda will be comparatively safe in this cabin while I am searching for your father and Mr. Philander. Come, call the woman, and I will hurry on. They can't have gone far. Jane did as he suggested, and when he saw the door close safely behind them, Clayton turned toward the jungle. Some of the sailors were drawing the spear from their wounded comrade, 
and as Clayton approached, he asked if he could borrow a revolver from one of them while he searched the jungle for the professor. The rat-faced one, finding he was not dead, had regained his composure, and with a volley of oaths directed at Clayton, refused in the name of his fellows to allow the young man any firearms. This man, Snipes, had assumed the role of chief since he had killed their former leader, and so little time had elapsed that none of his companions had as yet questioned his authority. Clayton's only response was a shrug of the shoulders, but as he left them he picked up the spear which had transfixed Snipes, and thus primitively armed, the son of the then Lord Greystoke strode into the dense jungle. Every few moments he called aloud the names of the wanderers. The watchers in the cabin by the beach heard the sound of his voice growing ever fainter and fainter, until at last it was swallowed up by the myriad noises of the primeval wood. While Professor Archimedes Q. Porter and his assistant, Samuel T. Philander, after much insistence on the part of the latter, had finally turned their steps toward camp, they were as completely lost in the wild and tangled labyrinth of the matted jungle as two human beings well could be, though they did not know it. It was by the merest caprice of fortune that they headed toward the west coast of Africa instead of toward Zanzibar on the opposite side of the dark continent. When in a short time they reached the beach, only to find no camp in sight, Philander was positive that they were north of their proper destination, while, as a matter of fact, they were about two hundred yards south of it. It never occurred to either of these impractical theorists to call aloud on the chance of attracting their friend's attention. Instead, with all the assurance that deductive reasoning from a wrong premise induces in one, Mr. Samuel T. Philander grasped Professor Archimedes Q. Porter firmly by the arm, and hurried the weakly protesting old gentleman off in the direction of Cape Town, fifteen hundred miles to the south. When Jane and Esmeralda found themselves safely behind the cabin door, the negress's first thought was to barricade the portal from the inside. With this idea in mind she turned to search for some means of putting it into execution, but her first view of the interior of the cabin brought a shriek of terror to her lips, and like a frightened child the huge woman ran to bury her face on her mistress's shoulder. Jane, turning at the cry, saw the cause of it lying prone upon the floor before them, the whitened skeleton of a man. A further glance revealed a second skeleton upon the bed. "'What horrible place are we in?' murmured the awestruck girl, but there was no panic in her fright. At last, disengaging herself from the frantic clutch of the still shrieking Esmeralda, Jane crossed the room to look into the little cradle, knowing what she should see there even before the tiny skeleton disclosed itself in all its pitiful and pathetic frailty. What an awful tragedy these poor mute bones proclaimed! The girl shuddered at thought of the eventualities which might lie before herself and her friends in this ill-fated cabin, the haunt of mysterious, perhaps hostile, beings. Quickly, with an impatient stamp of her little foot, she endeavored to shake off the gloomy forebodings, and turning to Esmeralda bade her cease her wailing. "'Stop, Esmeralda! Stop at this minute!' she cried. "'You are only making it worse!' She ended lamely a little quiver in her own voice as she thought of the three men, upon whom she depended for protection, wandering in the depth of that awful forest. Soon the girl found that the door was equipped with a heavy wooden bar upon the inside, and after several efforts the combined strength of the two enabled them to slip it into place, the first time in twenty years. Then they sat down upon a bench with their arms about one another, and waited. End of chapter.